So what I was thinking we could do today is we'd actually just uh, go through this study guide and um, and just, you know, uh, quite, quite a few people have actually already took uh, the exams um, and have done pretty well. Um, so I've been pretty impressed. So just know if you haven't taken it, your, your odds are good. Um, and obviously, the more you study, the, the better you'll do. Um, and this should help quite a bit because um, we're going to go through um, – and, and I really truly think that as long as you know, like what these are, what they do, um, the better, the better, um, you know, it'll, it'll help you for both exams, um, really, really well. Um, but I also wanted to mention that in the recording I posted, um, in the announcement, there are some, in that video, I actually go through some of the sample questions, um, and discuss those. Um, I didn't want to do them over again twice. Um, um, because in that video, we obviously don't go over this as well. Um, so I kind of wanted to go over this. That way, maybe you have a little bit of both. Um, um, and then that way we can go through. I don't know if you guys have already done this, um, but we're going to do a little bit of it um, right now. Hopefully, um, I can give you some pointers as well as we go along. Um, but I guess before we jump into that, does anyone have any questions or insight um, about no. this? I actually have one, not about this specifically, but the exam. Uh -huh. I had a, like a mutant question with three, um, like on the query one. Uh, it came with an extra row uh, for an answer. And it marked me off for it. Should oh. I email it to you, like in the screenshots or? Yeah, yeah. If you want to shoot me a message and on Teams or email, that'll work. There are a couple of questions that are... Um, I, I checked after on references on the vocabulary exam that I think should be right. Um, I'm going to send those over email to you as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I actually go through all the vocabulary exams um, because there's like mm -hmm. a lot of times, like, like, for example, I know there's a question for uh, um, that the answer is sequence. And, and if you put sequences, then it, it marks you wrong. So, you know, obviously I give those ones. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions, just feel free to shoot me a note and I'll take a look at your exam. I go through them all anyways, but it, okay. feel free to point them out to me because it helps me. So, right yep, good question. All right. Um, so, yeah, let's jump into this. Um, so, what I'm going to try to do actually, let me turn on this. Let's see if we can get these windows tiled over here so we can see a little bit better. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to, um, I think McLaughlin's website is uh, one of the best resources for studying for this these exams. Um, so that's actually what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna keep it over, over here on the right and then uh, we'll just go through here. Um, I'm not actually gonna type them out. Um, I'm just gonna show you where they are and we'll talk a little bit about it just for the sake of time because I don't wanna waste your time talking because um, I'm sure you don't wanna sit there and listen to my keyboard clatter away. Um, so let's just jump right in. So the first thing is SQL. What does it stand for? Um, because uh, obviously it could be on the test, pretty popular question. Um, and the other thing is a lot of these, um, as I go through, I'm actually gonna point out a lot of interview questions um, that I would ask that I have asked on many interviews, just in case any of you guys um, you know, are close or you know, come across a job. Um, hopefully it might help you with some interview questions as well. So um, I'll give you kind of like the, the main ones. Um, so anyways, SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Um, you can kind of Google that and find that anywhere. Uh, but Structured Query Language, um, yeah, I'm not going to go too much into it. Kind of just got to know what it stands for because um, that's what we've been doing all year. Um, so I know I talked a bit about this last time, and I even put these little definitions in here because I actually edited this just a little bit. DDL, what does it stand for? It stands for Data Definition Language. Um, and, and over here, what I really like is you kind of have to just look a little bit for it, but it actually has a few of these, um, these categories kind of built, um, you know, really good for studying. So I'm going to click right here on this DDL commands, um, and it'll actually show me all of these DDL commands. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with if you want to put um, a link in your notes or whatever, but um, the way I like to remember DDL commands 
um, is because realistically for me, if you understand all the terms, um, you can kind of piece together a lot of, a lot of this stuff, especially on the vocabulary exam and even on the, the query exam. Um, so anyways, a data definition uh, command is one that defines um, and I like and I brought up this metaphor before but when we're talking about uh, databases we talk about structures and then we talk about the data itself so I always like to think of it like a, a database the structure is the house you know everything's in there but all the rooms are empty like when you move into a new apartment the apartment or the house itself is the structure and then we fill it with data um, you know, and that could be a lot of things, just like an empty house, uh, you know, it has empty cabinets, uh, all that kind of stuff. Those could be tables. But anyways, the structure itself is, is the, the DDL. Um, so anything to do with the structure is, is data definition language. It defines things. It, it deals with the definition. Um, so the create stable statement obviously is, is definition. You're defining a table. Um, alter, you are altering the definition. So anything to do with the structures, a drop, drop the table. So you're removing the structure entirely. Um, rename, truncate, and comment. Basically, all this has to do with the structure of the table. Um, and we'll go into a lot of these things, but you know, let's just do it right now. So when we're talking about DDL statements, um, the create statement, um, we create new objects, um, create table create sequence, uh, create or replace procedure. Um, you know, all those things. Um, we're creating structure, um, a, an object. And then the alter statement, and, and obviously when we go into individual like create table and all that kind of stuff, we'll, we'll go into more detail. Alter, um, you know, you alter the definition, you know, whether you guys have done it many times. That's what I think is really great about this is none of this should be new. Um, it should all be stuff that we've seen before. We've actually practiced it. So we've all altered our table. You know, I remember um, multiple times in the lab, we add columns to a table. We use an alter table statement. Um, the drop table, that's probably the only one that we haven't done. Like, uh, we do it every time we run the lab, but, you know, you don't see it quite as much because a lot of it's in the cleanup script. But to drop a table, drop, you know, and you just say the, whatever it is. So you could say drop table and then the name of the table or drop sequence, the name of the sequence. Rename, I, we've renamed columns before. Truncate. Um, so this is, this is a big one. This is one of the biggest interview questions that you'll get asked for any database administration job. What is the difference between delete and truncate? Because we've ran delete statements before, you know, before we can say, you know, delete from, uh, contact where last name equals Harry Potter and we delete all the Harry Potter records. Well, they're going to ask you what's the difference between delete and truncate. And the difference is, is delete will log it to the redo buffer log. Um, but the difference is, is it's a little slower, whatever, but the truncate statement just wipes it clean and it doesn't even log it. So the big question you'll get is, um, if you want to roll back, you know, we've seen those before. We talked about how there's the, and we'll talk later about those, the commit and roll back um, or the begin transaction. And you can either commit it or roll it back to undo it like a save point in a video game. Um, you can roll back a delete statement. So let's say I said, you know, delete from contact where last name equals Harry Potter and you delete them. Um, but let's say we did it. So we say begin transaction. We run our delete for the Harry Potter's. And then we're sitting there and the boss checks it and he says, oh, I actually forgot. We didn't need to delete the Potters. We want to delete the Smiths. Well, then you can just say roll back transaction and it's all good like it never happened, right? But if you use truncate, it's going to be gone forever. There is no rolling back a truncate. So truncate will almost like mass erase out of a table and you can limit it, but basically whatever you erase is gone forever. There is no coming back. So truncate is mostly used um, for temp tables. So a good example is if you like create a temporary table um, to do some work, maybe you just want to truncate it or an import table. Um, you know, obviously our import tables are pulling from a CSV, but let's say you had another table that is kind of like in between. And every time you do an import, you load it, modify, export, and then wipe. Um, truncate would be good there.
because you don't ever worry about saving that data because you're putting it somewhere else. But um, that's a big one. Interview question is what's the difference between delete and truncate? And the difference is deletes can be rolled back, truncates cannot. Um, and then a comment, we don't need to worry too much. I don't think you'll ever see a question on the comment, but the comment just lets you add a comment that's stored with the table. So you, like if we were adding a comment to a column, um, we could, uh, let's just take a look. So like if we wanted to um, comment on column, so like item title, a video item title. Um, you know, you can just add comments that way if someone's ever looking through and doesn't know what you were referring to, you can put a little note for there for them. Um, I don't think there's any questions on the test about comment, but just so you know. All right, DML. So we talked a lot about DDL. Let's talk a little bit about DML statements and where are those. There should be one here. In week six, there's one of these we might have to search for. Let's just do DML. I think I've done this before because obviously I had that saved there. Data transaction, blah, 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 index. Here, let's go like this. Let's say, obviously I'm gonna get a lot. Let's go back to his home page and try again. Apparently it's not there. So DML, let's just let's hear something. It's right there, I think. Yeah, that one. And it'll have all four of them. Oh, okay. I knew it was there. Yes, this is the page I was looking for. Um, yeah, there, there's one of these. The perfect. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and that just takes you right there. So we'll just talk about this. So data manipulation language, um, you know, because DDL is the structure. Um, in, in data manipulation, and it's that middle word, the definition, we're dealing with the de definition. And then manipulation means that we're actually manipulating the data. That's kind of how I, I always remember. Um, so I, I look at the command and I say, okay, does this deal with the data or the structure? So um, the DML commands are insert, obviously we're adding data, an update statement, we're changing some data, a merge statement, which is both an insert and an update, or possibly a delete, um, and then the delete. And the delete, um, obviously we just talked about, we'll remove um, items from the table. Now the interesting thing is truncate is under the data definition language, where delete is down here. And the big difference is that the truncate statement um, does not write the changes to a logging file and the data manipulation command delete does. Um, so that's kind of the big uh, difference there. So remember that when you think about truncate, think about it like you're uh, um, almost just like mass erasing out of the, the table, um, almost obliterating into existence where the delete command of the reason it's a manipulation language is because we're logging like everything we do. Um, so that's DML. Um, and then DCL is the data control language. And this one's nice and easy because it's just grant and revoke. Um, just, and, and, and this has to do with permissions and this is the only thing that we probably haven't seen that much. Um, and, and it's just how you grant permissions to a user on a table um, or revoke those permissions. Um, so, for example, if we wanted to give all permissions on, let's say we add a new user and we want him to be able to do everything on our student database, we would say grant all privileges on st student to, and then the user. And then obviously you can revoke those. So data control language, think about rights, grant and revoke. And then our transaction control language or TCL is, is our video game save point. So we have... Um, we have a save point for a transaction. So you, you say save point um, to bookmark where the changes start. And then once you have that save point, you can either choose to roll back, which is undo the changes, 
or commit, which is save those changes permanently. So, so those ones are all kind of nice and easy. The majority of the test will be right here in these. All right, um, and then, so now we're gonna jump into select statements. This one's kind of a big one. And, and you're, I don't think you'll ever get asked necessarily specifically about um, the order of operations because this is, this is the big part here. Um, but the order of operations will come in handy because there will be lots of questions. And, and if you've taken this, you, you'll, you'll know. Um, it'll say, what is the error, right? On the, the query exam, it'll say, what's the error? Well, maybe there's two errors you need to choose the one that's gonna trigger first because that's the correct answer because there might be two, two errors listed in the answers that are, are accurate, but you gotta know which one comes first. So um, we're gonna take a look and go over the select statement and the order that it operates. Um, so right over here, um, sorry, I forgot to point that out. There's a nice, uh, right here under week one, the select statement section. If you just click the select statement, um, it's going to talk a lot about it. Now this goes through, what each of these do and I think we all know what these do um, but just to uh, clarify on some of the ones that we maybe not have used as much group by um, is, is how values are aggregated or grouped um, so for example let's say you want a count of everybody uh, here's a good example um, just recently I had to get a count of all the last names because of COVID, they're thinking about splitting how kids come to school and they wanted to do it by household, which means last name. So what I had to do is I had to get a count of each last name so we knew where to split, um, you know, the students in the district or whatever. Um, so what I did is I wrote a query and I, you know, got every, I, I basically I got a result set that had everybody's uh, last name. Um, you know, so I literally had everybody's, imagine seeing everyone's uh, first and last name. Um, but to get a count of that, if I add a count, because I want to see how many people are, have the last name that start with C, um, you have to combine all those rows into, into a single one and count them. So that's what the group by does is we're saying, look, group by the first letter of everybody's last name. Um, and then you can get the count. So anytime we have an aggregate um, function, so anytime we're combining multiple rows into one, uh, we, you know, adding, if we're taking multiple transactions to get a total sum, um, averaging, if we're taking multiple GPAs and, and averaging those, um, or counting, or, you know, anything like that, anything that's an aggregate function, it requires a group by clause because we have to tell the computer Oh, how are we going to group these? What, what do you want these grouped by? So that's what the group by does. And then the having goes hand in hand with group by. Um, because we have a where clause that filters pre-aggregated rows. That's important. Um, the where clause filters pre-aggregated rows. So in the case of the last name, let's say I, um, I'm trying to get a count, but for whatever reason we want to exclude um, a certain letter of the alphabet. I don't know why we would, but let's say we did, you would put that in the where clause because we want those excluded before we aggregate it. But let's say, um, you know, so there's, there's a where clause example. Let's say that after I aggregate it, so I have the alphabet A through Z and the total number of last of people with that last name. Um, but I don't want to see anyone who has less than one, right? I only want to see uh, letters that have two or more. Um, then, because we're now aggregated, I would use the having clause to filter out the aggregated rows. And I think we've done that before. Um, and there's some nice examples here, so I don't want to get too crazy. But for example, here's a, an average. So here we have the brand. So this is cereal, right? Um, we have cereal, and then we have the average cost in ounces. So we basically what we're doing here is we're trying to figure out you know, which cereal is the cheapest or the best value? Because let's say we're really smart shoppers. We're trying to see which one's the best value. Um, and so what we do is we, um, we get all of those, but let's say we only want to see where the, the average um, retail ounce, you know, the, the cost per ounce is greater than 22 cents. 
Now, normally if we were value shoppers, we'd flip that around and see less than 22 cents, but this is probably more coming from the, oh, we are, uh, we make these cereals. You work for the company that makes these cereals and we want to see um, what our most expensive cereals are. Something like that. Um, so that's what the, the group buy tells you how to sort it. So in this case, uh, blueberry toast crunch. And then the, the having clause um, filters out the post aggregate results. Okay, and the rest you should know. I think you'll, you'll know pretty well. Now, they go through all these depending on what clauses they have. But the thing is, is it doesn't really change. Um, so I like to just go with the, with the, the big one and just, I, I actually commit it to memory, right? So if it's got everything, um, the select from where order by group by and having clause, the order of operations is like this. And this is how I like to remember it. So if you think about it, you know, even though we write select first, that's the last step. Cause that's just kind of what it shows. Um, you know, but the first thing is we have to gather all of our data and, and put it together. So the first thing that runs is the from, from clause. It's going to pull the data from the tables. And if you do any joins, it's going to take care of that, right? The joins are part of the from clause. So if you do any joins, it's part of the from clause. The second step is the where. So, okay, we have all of our data. Let's filter out what we don't need because we don't want to do any work on what we don't need. So we're going to filter that out with the where clause. So once we're all filtered, then we do the group by. So if there is one, right? If there's not one, we can skip this step. But if there's a group by, let's, let's perform our aggregations. Let's do our calculations. Combine those rows up. And then obviously having, let's filter any of those out that we don't need. Now we're, we, we have our final result set. And now we just need to make it pretty. So let's sort it. And then the last step is let's show what they asked. So that's kind of how I like to remember it. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Um, you know, I think if you were the programmer who sit, sat down with, you know, the C language and wrote this, you know, it makes perfect sense. Um, so if you think about it like that, logical. Um, in, in fact, lots of times I like to think about like, oh, if, if instead of, you know, some our abstract concept that's in a computer, think about each record being a piece of paper, how would you do it, you know? you'd walk over to the filing cabinet and let's say you need files from bin one and bin two. Well, you'd get both those bins. Then what you do is you'd, you'd match up all the papers, right? Let's say you're getting ready for parent teacher conferences back in uh, little house on the prairie times, right? Um, you go get your two bins and, and you'd combine your folders, get all the kids matched up, you know, cause let's say one has their, uh, report card and the other one has their test results you know you take the two bins and combine the kids together because you want the kids ordered up together so you can give the paper to their parents so that's the from clause um, and let's say that you know you only need it's day one of parent teacher conferences and you only see half your class so then you would where the last name is a through j so you would filter those and grab those out of the out of there right? Um, and then this next step is you group them, whatever, not applicable to this scenario. You're having, you do that as well. Um, and then order by, maybe they're not in alphabetical order anymore. So you put them in alphabetical order, um, or maybe they're coming at different times. So you put them in the order that the parents have requested a, a time. And then the last thing is, is let's say each one of those folders had multiple papers during parent teacher conferences, you would actually only pull the certain folders that you want to talk about or the certain papers you'd want to talk about out onto the table. So it kind of makes sense logically if you think about it. So just know that it's not the way it's written. It's, it's logical. And that's, like I said, that's, that's very important. Um, okay. And in tables, I'm not going to talk about these. Uh, hopefully, you all know what primary foreign key stuff is at this point. And hopefully, you all know what a table is with columns and rows. So if you didn't, I'd be a little worried. Um, sequences, you should all know. Um, transactions, we talked about. We talked about joins. Now, joins, the one thing I want to make sure to point out, 
um, whenever you're doing, uh, if you're looking at that test question and it has to do with joins, um, you know, pull up this, this image. Um, just Google search for SQL joins or DuckDuckGo, whatever searches your fancy, um, and pull up this. This is vital um, because this is going to tell you exactly the results that it's going to return. There will be questions about this. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely, because it might actually show this, this picture and say, what join is this? So you might want to, you know, keep that handy. Um, okay, let's talk about subqueries because it's right here. Um, so the subqueries, there are four types, um, scalar, single row, multiple row, and correlated. So um, a scalar subquery returns one column and one row. So a, a scalar column, a scalar subquery really returns a single value right? Um, because you can't have two values in a column. And if it returns one column in one row, it's actually saying I return a single value. So if I said select last name from contact where, uh, you know, contact ID equals one, you're going to get one value, which is important because when you're writing applications, it's really important because sometimes, you know, you can only include one row. So for example, in this case, it's a subquery. If we said select everything from contact where contact ID equaled, and then we put select um, contact ID from contact where last name equals Potter, you know, that's going to return multiple rows and you're going to get an error because it's going to say the subquery returned more than one row. Um, so if you use an equal sign, you have to use a scalar subquery because it's expecting one value. A single row subquery returns one row with two or more columns. Now the key here is it returns one row with two or more columns. So, so that's a, a single row, it could return, you know, last name and first name. A multiple row subquery returns two or more rows with two or more columns. You know, and it kind of makes sense. Single row, multiple row. Just know that scalar means one value. Um, single row means, you know, I like to just think it could return a whole row, but only one of those. A multiple row is like an array of objects, right? Um, and then a correlated subquery includes a join between the subquery and the outer statement. That's, that's really important. Um, so a nice example of a, of a correlated subquery would be if you, um, you know, let's say you had a select statement that said uh, select um, the item name, item title, and item rating, just like up here, right? Let's say you had this, um, but let's say that you wanted um, only the people who had, uh, well, let's scratch that. Let's say you, not this, let's say you did a query of rentals, right? And, you know, we could just join to item uh, or we could write a subquery. And let's say you say, um, you know, select everything from rental item and you want to see what the item title is. So you say select everything from rental item, but you add to your select list. You know, let's just write it out. It'll be easier. So select ri dot rental item ID. And let's say you just want the rental item and the item title. Well, we could do a join, right? We could say I dot item title and then say from rental item RI inner join um, item I on RI dot item ID equals I dot item ID. You know, this is the preferred method, but sometimes there's there's times that you have to do things a little differently. So instead of an inner join, you know, you would write a correlated subquery where you would say, and sometimes you just have to do this. In fact, I just did one today um, that I had to do this way. Um, so you would say select um, I dot item title from item or item ID and I don't even need item title, let's just say. Yeah, let's keep it, just so we can make it look like normal item title, where I dot item ID is equal to, 
ri.item ID. Now notice we didn't do a join, but we, we did this correlated subquery. And what makes it correlated is we're actually pulling this ri.item ID into the subquery, which you can do. And we would say as title, something like that. So this would actually run, it would run great. Um, there's just sometimes you have to do that because maybe your result set's a little different. Um, but that's a correlated subquery. Anytime you include um, an item from the outer query and the inner query, it's a correlated subquery. Um, so yeah. All right, let's take a look here. Here's our subqueries. Let's take a look at these because these are also ones that we haven't spent a whole ton of time with. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about them. Um, <clears throat> and these are called set operators. Um, and, and basically, because we've done a lot with joins, and, and this is where uh, most people get confused. So when we do a join, we're attaching tables, we're combining tables horizontally. Right, so if we take contact and telephone, you know, we want to add, you know, across the side, we want to see, you know, this name and this telephone number. Um, so I like to think about when we're doing joins, we're gluing things on horizontally. When we do anything with a set operator, we're dealing with vertical. Um, and so um, sometimes, let's say you said you wanted everybody. Um, I, I always use this as an example. Uh, let's say that we're dealing with everybody who um, took database CIT 225, the CIT 225 class and uh, the web development design. All right, let's say you're the university and you're looking for someone who might be a potential candidate for uh, an internship. Um, so you would, you would run your query to get everyone who took CIT 225 and then you would say intersect, and then the second query. And then you would get the results of people who had taken both. It gives you the common denominator. If you're looking at a Venn diagram, it would be the middle, but the only difference is, is it's between two queries. And instead of gluing on the sides, it's going to um, just shorten your list. It's basically, it's how we filter our list between two queries. So intersect, let's see if we got a good example here. Yep, so there's our Venn diagram. Um, so for example, if we got all the um, ordinal English, and the, uh, this is kind of a crazy example, but uh, I don't like that example too much. But you know, for example, if A was 225 students and B was web development design, you know, the intersect is what's gonna give you there in the middle. So just to write some pseudocode, if we said select um, p dot first name, p dot last name from person p interjoin transcript t where t dot oh we need an on clause. You know, I'm just kind of writing some pseudocode here, um, you know, because we need to get our join here between our person and our transcript. And then we say where t dot transcript, or let's just say t dot course name is equal to CIT 225. Right, something like that. There's our query one. And then we would say intersect. And then we would basically put the same query here. I believe it's 230. So that would be our intersect and it would return people who had taken both CIT 225 and CIT 230, but they had to take both. The next one is a union and the union operator returns the unique set of rows found in both queries. So for example, if I typed union here, now we would get um, all the people who took CIT 225 
and anyone who had taken CIT 230. But because all we have is the first name and last name, names would only show up once because it returns the unique set of rows found between both queries. So let's say we wanted um, just anyone who has taken either CIT 225 or CIT 230 or both. We could say union, you know, because if we were looking for, for potential candidates, we would see both here. Now let's say we wanted to, um, let's say we added one, one column here. Let's say we added the T dot course name to our queries. And that's the fun thing is they, they need to have the same results here. Um, if we added that, now the name would actually show up twice because we would, we're no longer, there would be two values that are each unique because this one would say CIT 225 and this one would say CIT 230. So we would end up with a result set that would look like, you know, if I had taken both of those, you would see two rows, two results looking like this. Because we added that t dot course name. Um, without that t dot course name, obviously we would not have this. And then there are duplicate rows, so it excludes that and we'd only get the one result set. However, if we did this and said union all, regardless of whether they're unique or not, it will return both. So we would actually get this. Even with the, with the union all, we would get both. All right, and then the minus. So this one is also a good one. So let's say we wanted to see all the students who have not taken CIT 225 um, that are a CIT major. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to change this just a little bit. We're actually going to take out um, this transcript thing here. And we're going to say, let's get every first and last name from person. And we're going to interjoin uh, major m on p dot person id equals m dot person id. And, you know, and usually it wouldn't look like this because usually it would be like major assignment or whatever. Say m dot code. You know, so this is going to return everybody who's a CIT major, right? And then we want to see all the students who have not taken CIT 225. Well, we could write a join that, you know, did a does not equal, you know, left join type thing. Or we can do this. We can write one query that pulls everybody and then subtract those who have taken CIT 225 with a minus. So this is going to return everybody and then we are going to minus or subtract those who have taken CIT 25 and what we're left with is those who have not taken CIT 225. Does that make sense to everybody? These, because I know we haven't dealt a ton with these, so I want to make sure that these make sense to everybody. Everybody good there? Yep, thank you. Perfect. Yeah, they're not too crazy, but I just want to make sure um, everybody's good. Um, and that's kind of the majority of these. Um, so real quick, um, so I hopefully you have all looked at this by now. Um, is there anything that you guys have a question about? Any term on here that you don't know? Yes. It says to know the ANSI 92 and the ANSI 89 versions and the differences. Is that just dealing with unions? Uh, yep. Yeah, that is, well, that'll be with uh, joins. So let's, I'm sorry. Let's, I let's, meant joins. <laughs> I, I figured. I figured. So yeah. Uh, it's it's tough because a you know, union you think of join, um, but let's let's talk about that because um, it is a big deal, um, and this is actually one of my one of my favorite topics actually surprisingly because um, it's it's kind of funny, so um, you know we for the most part have always done um, ANSI ninety two, um, and in fact you see this uh, an inner join 
is ANSI 92. Um, so, so let's actually real quick, I'll, I'll write a couple of these out. And maybe we talked about this in lab five. We might have, um, but we're going to do it again. Um, so ANSI 92, and if you take a look at a lot of these, where is those joints? Week five. Week five, here we go. Somewhere on here, there's a place where you can click between ANSI 92 and 89. Let's try two table joins. All right, well, we'll go through it. Somewhere on here, there is an ANSI. I saw it on the previous page. Oh, did you? Did I just miss it? Yeah. Okay. It was right up a little bit. Right here. Okay, you have to click that little down arrow to see the example. Okay, but what I really like about this is, is I think if you understand ANSI 89 syntax, um, ANSI 92, it just helps you really understand it at a deep level. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about that real quick. I'm glad you brought that up. So let's, uh, let's take a typical join, that, that one of my favorites. Let's get the contact. Um, first name, uh, C dot last name, and T dot telephone number. You know, and then we'd say from contact C, and then, you know, normally we write um, an inner join, something like that. Um, so remembering our order of operations, our from clause is what's going to is what's going to complete first, and and that's you know we're going to again that's why it's important to remember this. Um, the so the from clause, and and what this is going to do is it's let's talk about this is ANSI ninety two. Let's back up just a little bit. You know that's how we're used to seeing it. Well ANSI eighty nine, which is kind of the old school way, um, went like this. You would say select. Same thing, in fact, let's just grab this. So it would look very similar. The only difference is you would actually just put a, a, a comma in between those um, to, to do the join. And then you would say where c.contact ID is equal to t.contact ID. Now, if you take a look at this, you might actually start to see um, remembering order of operations. Order of operations is, is very important as we all know from math, right? Um, order of operations can make a big difference in the outcome. And in this case, um, our outcome is, is performance. Um, so the old way, let's, let's think about what's happening here. Um, because we know our from clause goes first. So whenever we run this, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to hit here and it says, okay, from contact C telephone T, you know, and let's actually, let's just, let's just boot up virtual box. This will be fun just to see. I don't know if fun's the right word for you guys, but. Um, let's untile these windows here for a minute. All right, let's grab our fedora here um, because this will be fun. Cause you'll actually get to see, um, we don't have enough records in our tables to do like a full um, performance analysis on this, but it's really cool. If you ever get a huge table, you can actually see the difference in the time it takes for the query to run. And then if you monitor the amount of RAM being used by the server, you'll really notice it. You know, if you're Facebook, you're talking big, big differences. Um, so let's take a look here and we can, uh, Gets booted up. We'll we'll give her a shot. And if this is gonna stay a little, that'll be a little bit. Oh, because I'm running huge. Um, we'll just do it small. Okay, so 
I'm I'm actually gonna take this query and we're just gonna paste it in there. And I must have broke something. I know VirtualBox had some issues. Um, and I'm not even in SQL Plus anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay. So if if I were to run this, um, C dot first name, C dot last name, and T dot telephone number from contact C telephone T. We get 225 rows selected. Um, because what it's doing is it's giving you every possible combination. So it doesn't care about matching. It doesn't care about anything. It takes every contact. It takes every telephone number and it multiplies them. So, so Harry Potter has a record for everybody's phone number, you know, and we don't have that many people. In fact, you know, if we, uh, I think we have like, so we have 15 telephone records and 15 contacts you know and that's pretty small for a database table. i mean it's minuscule um and we end up with 225 rows so you can imagine what that looks like when you have hundreds of thousands of rows or millions of rows in each table um but this is what they did they they got every possible combination and then they filtered it out so you know it's if we're going to run that same query again, we get the first name, the last name, the telephone number from contact C, telephone T. Um, you know, at that point we have 225 rows, but then if we add a where clause, then we filter out where it is. But that's after we've already loaded 225 rows of data into our memory and then the computer has to sort through those 200 well it has to iterate over 225 rows of data to filter out to determine where contact id is equal to contact id between the tables um, so when we add that where clause then it filters it out but the important piece in there is the order of operations because the from clause executes and we end up with 225 rows then the computer is going to iterate over every row in the result set and only return basically if if contact id in contact is equal to t dot contact id then it returns true and it's going to keep the result set um, it, the keep that record otherwise it's going to just keep going down and not not display it um, but the difference here so so that's ANSI 89 it's just a comma so know that in the from clause, it's not going to do any filtering. All the filtering, all the matching has to be filtered. In fact, it doesn't really match. It just filters out all the garbage records. Because really, you know, that's not Harry Potter's phone numbers. It's a mismatch. It's garbage. Um, but in ANSI 92, this is all the from clause. So the computer, while it's loading the data, does the matching for us. And, and so we never have to load 225 records into memory to, to manipulate. So we say select C dot first name, C dot last name. You guys have seen this before, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this one. This is what you're used to, telephone number from contact C, enter join telephone T on C dot contact. E is equal to t dot contact id you know this is basically the equivalent of the previous query but the only difference is is it's it's much more efficient and it's much more faster even though we won't be able to see with the small number of records but um, just know that um, when you're going through those joins um, i would just take a peek at the the ansi 89 um, and really it's not too complicated because really all it comes down to is, is the where clause. Um, so for example, if we were to go back, that was a left join. Um, let's take a look at the inner join. Oh, we just did an inner join. So let's actually go back to the left join. Um, you know, and they use this 
plus operator, but you know, you can, um, our relative comp, oh, I wish they wouldn't do that in this one. Um, but you know, the left join, you could, you know, use your, use your logic to uh, exclude or include all the rows or whatever. Um, Cause you'd have to use an or, so you could say where ordinal English ID or French is equal to that or ordinal French text is null. You know, you just use an or clause or you could use this. I have a question. Yep. How did you get there? Um, <laughs> so if you click down here under week five, uh -huh. um, it should have wherever week five is, it has uh, these two table joins. Uh huh. And then in here it has all these. So then you can pick your joints. Like let's say if you want to look at an inner join. Um, and then from there you can click on the little arrow that by the example. And then, then you can click on the, ah, the two that's different. That's what I missed. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. But yeah, so that's the difference. And I'm trying to, I, you won't see too much. Um, you might see a couple 89 syntax ones. Um, but the reason why you, you need to know, and, and again, if you know order of operations, it's not going to be too much of a problem, but I don't want you to get thrown off when you see this comma and trying to wonder what's, what's going on. Um, so, so that's why it's good to know both. In fact, funny story, the first time I took my, uh, my Oracle certification exam, um, I actually had, had never seen ANSI 89 syntax. And, and so I go in there and I get to this question. I'm like, huh? <laughs> uh, and I assumed it worked, but I didn't know the, the, the deep inner workings of it. And so that's why I like to explain it. Cause when you get to those, I don't want you to get thrown off and you're trying to, you know, if there's an error purposely in here, knowing the order of operations is just massive. So. So this may be a question you've already answered and I just missed it. And if so, I apologize. Under what circumstances is one used over the other? Like, so, how, how would you know if your system is an ANSI 89 or an ANSI 92, or does it matter? So really the only reason we still even talk about ANSI 89, because well, all it is is it's the year SQL standards came out. So in, mm -hmm. in 1989, or, or pre, yeah, so in 1989, they said this is a SQL standard. So, you know, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, they all kind of say, okay, SQL standard, we're all going to kind of use the same format. Um, and it worked. But then in 1992, they came out with this and they're like, we have a better way. So we're all going to do it this way now. Um, so the only reason we still kind of talk about 89, A, I think it helps understand actually how 92 works and why it's better, but um, is for old code. So it's not really like your systems, because all systems, anything you use is going to be able to do ANSI 92 syntax. Um, the only reason we still talk about ANSI 89 is because they're, you know, we all know how businesses go. There's still people using like old systems running on like DOS. Um, but, um, you know, so, so if you ever come across some old, old code, you know, you, you know how, you know what it's doing. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yep. No problem. But yeah, that's the only reason um, because everything is now supporting ANSI 92. Um, if it's not, I wouldn't use it. But yeah, everything I know of is using ANSI 92. So yeah, and, and but surprisingly, you know, what's funny is some of the old cats that are still, you know, working, some of them I think still do this. I, I still see answers on Stack Overflow that do joins like this. Um, I don't know why. I think, uh, and oftentimes you'll, you'll also see this, because this is also an equivalent. You'll see just a join statement instead of a comma, um, just as join. Um, you'll see a lot of that, and, and I think web developers who don't go through proper database training think that this is the only way for whatever reason. I mean, it is kind of logical, but I, yeah. Um, but I, I always, it's a little pet peeve of mine. I don't, don't use this. <laughs> so, you know, use, use the proper join. Um, because the equivalent, you know, if we take off this, this where clause, um, the equivalent is we have a cross join. So if you, if, 
even if you want those that actual results, um, still use ANSI 89, just use the correct uh, join type, which is a cross join. These will give you the same results. So yep, glad you brought that up. Any others? I'm wondering how we get to that website you're on. Um, so I think there's a link somewhere in the in the course materials, but um, it's michaelmclaughlin.info forward slash db1. Uh, I, I don't have that memorized. I actually just do a DuckDuckGo search for McLaughlin DB1 and it brings it up every time. Um, but I will post this in Teams. You have on the announcements already. Okay. On the first one. Perfect. Yep. I, yeah. Somewhere in there, I think I've shared it. Um, Sorry, I've never actually gone there. So that's why I was on there. Yeah, there I, I posted it in chat here too. So, um, And actually all the... Um, curriculum like in the in canvas is is actually directly from here um, so so it should be similar but but you know for studying and stuff I think this is nice because it's just organized well and you can move around quick all right um, but that's all I have unless there's more questions um, but just real quick want to reiterate if you want to see some sample questions uh, go watch that recording from uh, from the previous term um, it should help a little bit. I did have a really quick question. I have seen several comments on in Teams about how many times you can take a test. And I honestly, I haven't had a chance to look at the quizzes yet. Is there, can you tell us what the limits are and how many times you can retake it? Is that just yeah. the practice or is that the actual exam itself? Um, so I think the, all the practices, I think you can take as many times as you can, um, as you want. And in fact, um, if you want to make my job easier, because because uh, it saves your last score essentially. So if you if you don't end with like a hundred percent, it will actually save your scores, not hundred percent, and they're only worth like two points or five. They're not worth very many points, but but um, I go through, and if you attempted to to practice, I give everyone full points. But um, but if you want to, you can just finish on a good note and get a hundred percent. Let me uh, let me pull that up, and we can take a look at the requirements as they are. I used to know exactly what they were, but they did make some changes recently. So, I so the vocabulary is 15 minutes each attempt. You have two attempts. The SQL query is 420 minutes each attempt and you have two attempts. Okay, perfect. I'm sorry, did you say 15 minutes to take the vocabulary exam? 50. Oh, 50. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, man, yeah. we better be speed demons. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think, uh, I think you should, and, and, and you get two attempts, right? Correct. Let me, let me just double check. I want to just make sure. Yeah, two attempts. Okay. Um, so the final vocabulary, let's take a look at this. So 25 questions. Two attempts, yep. So the vocabulary exam were the 150 points, 50 minutes for each attempt, two attempts. And then, which is actually pretty good. I know they, they only actually used to give you um, one attempt. So the fact that you get two is actually pretty awesome. Yep, been two attempts, 420 minutes actually for the final query. So you get lots of time, 150 points, uh, two attempts. So, yep. Um, you know, and, and that's actually what I would say is, is I would say, you know, study. And then this is what I do with my master's is I would, I would study, um, take an attempt, um, you know, reevaluate where you stand, study some more, and then take your final attempt. We get seven hours to take this final. Is that right? That's what it looks like. <laughs> wow. I, I'm not, I'm not going to take away time. So yeah, whatever's <laughs> there, whatever's there is, is there. Um, so yep, 420 minutes. Um, I guarantee you, you won't uh, use it all. <laughs> I hope not. I please don't take the test for, for seven hours. 
I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. Um, but yeah, um, I, th- I think everyone will do, will do extremely well. I, I honestly don't think there's a reason um, why you wouldn't do too well. Uh, and and the takes, nice. It takes the higher of your two scores. Yes. Okay. Score to keep is the, the highest. So yep, it'll keep your highest score. Um, and the nice thing is the way the class is weighted. Um, it, I think it's actually a really good balance. Like your labs are, are worth a good chunk uh, of your score, um, which I appreciate because I'm not that good of a test taker for, uh, you know, I can retain information extremely well, but um, when it comes to taking a test, like I go pure panic mode and I have to go through a whole ritual cycle to, to make sure I get in a good mindset to take exams. So, uh, so I'm actually uh, really glad they give you two attempts a and, and I think the balance of the, the lab to, to exam ratio is really good. Um, so anyways, um, some last housekeeping items. Uh, tomorrow is the last day that I will accept lay work. Um, so if for whatever reason you want to submit something, um, whether that's lab 12, you know, whatever, um, make sure it's submitted by tomorrow. Um, um, because that's the last time I'll accept lay work purely because, you know, at some point I got to cut it off so I can actually, um, cause I actually have to have a deadline for when I got to submit the final grades as well. So, um, if you could be finished up by then, that'd be great. And, um, yeah, um, I know you guys all do really good on this exam. So on the two exams, um, any other questions? Thank you for this review. Oh, no problem. Yeah. And uh, if you go watch that other one, I go through a couple of the practice exams. Um, I don't know if it'll be helpful or not. Really, I I, I kind of kind of don't do that as much anymore because I, I found that going through this is, is almost just as good. But I also like that just in case you're the type that – if it helps calm your nerves to see some, you know, to see it, then great. You'll, you'll be able to take the practice, practice exams as well. But – um, yeah, I just don't want anyone to be kind of like too stressed about this because you guys will do awesome. So, um, yeah. Thank you for everything. Yep, no problem. Yeah, it's kind of sad. This is the last, the last go around. Um, I'm sure you guys are all happy. I'm all very happy for you, but because um, I remember what it was like when I finished a term, I was like, oh, that's, that's the best feeling ever. But sometimes it kind of stinks a little bit too. Um. But yeah, so anyways, uh, good luck on the exam. Um, if you need anything, um, oh, oh, also, please check your, your final grades. Just, just give them a quick glance. I, I went through everything um, that I could see as, as of yesterday. So if you submitted something, don't freak out because I'll, I'll definitely get it graded. Um, but um, check your grades because just in the odd chance that there's maybe some – because sometimes Canvas does weird things. Um, so just maybe double check everything. If you know you submitted something that hasn't been graded, let me know because I definitely want to make sure everybody gets the grade that they deserve. So maybe just do a quick glance to double check me. And if you see anything off, just let me know. I have one last question. It's not about the exams. It's about these virtual boxes that we have going on now. Yep. Um, the, what was the first one? The one that we did all of our assignments in, uh-huh. is that still going to be available to us after the class? Yeah, yeah, you'll be you. You can run that forever. In fact, the files are stored locally on your your computer. So even if you wanted just to get it off, but save it, um, if you go to wherever it's stored, um, and in fact, if you open up VirtualBox and go to your settings, um, and then go to where it says storage, um, it'll be under this VMDK. It should show you where it's located. Um, and so, like for me, mine's right here. And it'll say exactly where that location is. Um, so, and I, I just happen to know where mine is. So if I go in here, I can actually see um, all of my files. So if I wanted to keep this, I would actually just take and compress this to a zip file and put it on like a, you know, one of those external hard drives or whatever. Um, and then you can keep it, save it forever. Um, yep. Do you have, this is going to sound weird. Do you have anything like little simple instructions that we could have um, just to kind of know how to do this later? Like the one that we did um, for the web page. there's a ton of stuff in that that has like passwords and codes and whatnot that 
I am not going to remember in two days from now. I <laughs> don't remember already. And I know it's on my box and I, you've said it's something that great we can use in the future. Right now I don't have a need for it. I don't think, <laughs> but I don't want to lose the ability to use that. So how do I, again, I, I don't use virtual boxes hardly ever. So this was completely new to me. Yeah. Site forever, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so like for, if, if you want instructions on how to set one up, um, you can always go here. This website will be here, you know, hopefully forever, but, you know, obviously not forever, but, but yeah, this, this will be here. I'm not going to take this off. Um, you know, unless some unforeseen circumstance, but, but yeah, it's going to be there. So if you ever need to come back here, you can, you can always go through these again. Um, yeah. And, and there should be, yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, if you want to save the, your work, um, you know, if you want to save it all, um, you know, which is kind of nice if you ever want Oracle. Um, but honestly, if, you know, realistically, if, if you want to conserve space, what I would do is I would just take all, if you want to back up your SQL, just take your data drive out of the virtual machine and back that up. Um, and then what I would do is I would, uh, I, I would, if, you know, depending on what you want to save, but to me, uh, like if I was looking I, I never save my Fedora image, um, but you know because there, there's free alternatives because technically Oracle you have to pay for, which in this case you wouldn't have to worry about it because you're you're a student, um, and it, I think it's not a full version. But um, if you ever wanted to, you know, on this LAMP server you have Postgres already installed and ready to rock and roll, so um, just whatever you want to do. But yep, yeah, um, the, these files, wherever these are at, um, they should be there. So, so for example, with this LAMP server, um, wherever you put your uh, VirtualBox VM files, which again, it'll show you where it is. If you right click, go to settings and see the storage. Um, you know, this one's under my home directory, VirtualBox VM's LAMP server. So um, I could actually take and take this LAMP server and compress it, move it to a zip file, or you could just move it, you know, whatever, but I would, I would zip it. And then also in VirtualBox, you can actually export the appliance. So you can actually right click and just say export and it would, uh, you know, it'll actually export it to kind of like a, a single file kind of a thing for you if you ever wanted to move it to another computer. All right. This is going to sound silly, but the, um, the, um, Interface that you've been using uh, for the virtual box. That, where is that? Um, uh, sometimes you have to kind of pull it up. Um, if you, um, there is a way. Because all I have is my virtual box. I don't have any other anything else. Yeah, when you pull it up, up in the menus, it'll it'll say something like virtual box library. Um, no, I don't even have, I don't even have that screen at all. Yeah. So like, um, you're probably seeing, like if I actually start this, you're probably just yeah, seeing Yeah, I'm seeing this. my virtual box. Yes. Um, so yeah, if you click up here somewhere, um, somewhere here, there is a virtual box. Um, oh, you're in the lamp server, right? Yeah, and it, it should be, the menu should be the same. I'm in the drawer. I don't have any of those. All I have is a player and then file, power, removable device, maybe manage. And and if you, make sure you're not a VMware instead of a virtual box, maybe. Uh, maybe. Anyway, somewhere there's a way to get to the, uh, the actual, <laughs> um, the virtual box. Um, and like for me, I, I, uh, like if I want the virtual box, I just, uh, just have to actually open it. I don't know how it works on windows to be honest with you, but somewhere I know there's like a, a virtual box library or, or manager, virtual box manager is my view what it's called. Um, and that will pull up this, this screen. Um, 
And we could probably we could probably Google it. Let's let me. I actually have it on my Windows machine under Oracle, on the Start menu. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, and it is made by Oracle, so I don't know what it's called. Um, Virtual Box Show Manager. Uh, Oracle. Is Oracle VM VirtualBox? So I have one of those. Yeah, and that might be it. It's still trying to close down. Sorry, I didn't want to take away time from, from oh, going no to the guide, but have these. I just don't know what to do with them. Okay. But only on mine, all I show on mine is the Ubuntu. Yeah, because you might have put a, if you used VMware, uh -huh. um, in fact, I have VMware player right here. Let's, let's show the VMware version. Um, so if you use, in, in mine, again, it's probably going to look yes, a little different. Yes, that's what I have. Okay. So here, it'll almost be the same thing. Um, but if you go to the settings, uh, you'll be able to see where the, the storage is. So you'll click on hard disks, and it'll show you where the disk file is. And wherever that is, that's the that's the file you need to back. Those are the files you need to back up. Okay. All right, and that has all of our assignments and stuff in it. Yep. Well, because it'll have your whole virtual machine. So. Okay. So yep, it'll have everything in it. Okay. All right. So now I need to I, reopen. That. I have a question. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, I was looking over my grades, and I'm missing a few like about three of those participation and lifting others quizzes. Um, can we still turn those in? Yeah, let me, uh, if, you, if you need them, just shoot me a note with which ones you need and, and I'll, I'll put them back up. Okay, just to let you know on uh, Teams? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep, no problem. All right, well, if there's nothing else, else we will, uh, I guess, uh, take the plunge in the inevitable. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Thank no you. problem. It's been a good semester. You guys have all been great. Thanks for coming and good luck. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.